Hey guys, welcome to another A-level biology video and this is video number 4 about the gene technology topic and the first topic we will be covering is bioinformatics. So what is bioinformatics? Bioinformatics is formally defined as the collection, the processing and the analysis of biological information and data using computer software. So it actually covers a lot of different stuff. So there is a huge quantity of biological data which is generated every second because biological data is or also constitutes um, primary structure of proteins or, or the tertiary structure or the sequence of nucleotides in genes or the entire genomic sequences. So that's a lot of data. And the great thing about bioinformatics is that all of this data is collected on online databases which can be accessed via the internet and because those databases can be linked. So it's much easier to deal with such a whole mass of information and there are various different types of databases and those databases have been specially designed by computer software engineers to make the data available readily in a way that suits the people concerned. So you'd be confused but let's just go over this because bioinformatics is fundamentally it is combining biological data with computer technology and statistics and so using bioinformatics databases on biological data have been built up and they have been effectively linked together and these databases can hold a lot of information for example can hold gene sequences or perhaps the sequences of an entire genome can also ha hold amino acid sequences of proteins or the protein structures and what computer technology does is that it facilitates the process of collection and the analysis of such a mass of information and allows access to it via the internet because this is such a huge amount of information it would be difficult to collect and analyze it manually computers make it a much more easier task and because there is so much information because it is put on the internet it can be accessed easily by a lot of people who may need it for whatever reason and that is the great thing about bioinformatics because it isn't just storage and processing of biological data it is storage processing analysis using computer means and using stats Where such a massive information is very difficult to handle and make use of otherwise. And there are different specialized bases. And because the information needs to be in a form that can be searched. Because if this was in the form of books and upon books, upon books, upon books of genomic sequences, it would be really difficult to find the sequence that you want. And by being put in the form of compute in put on computers, it is easier to search for them. And that is the key role that software developers play in the development of such a system.
primary biological sequence information like the primary sequences of different amino acids or the nucleotide sequences of genes. As you can see, this would not have been possible if all the biological data was saved on soft copy. You couldn't have done that. And researchers can use BLAST to find similarities between sequences that they're studying and those that were already saved on or in the database. So when a genome has been sequenced, comparisons can be made with other known genomes. For example, the human genome can be compared with the genome of the fruit fly or the nematode worm or the malarial parasite. And we can match the sequences and we can calculate something called a degree of similarity. And close similarities indicate recent common ancestry. Obviously, there would be huge amounts of difference between the genome of a human and a nematode worm. But there would be less differences between that of an ape and a human. And that is an indication of close, closeness of common ancestry. Again, this is something that bioinformatics makes possible, but would not have been, we would not have been able to do if the data was saved as soft copy. So this is why bioinformatics isn't just collection, processing, and analysis of biological data. It is all of this with the use of computer technology, computer software, and the buildup of databases that link together and easily accessible via the internet. And that is why software developers play a huge role in making it possible to search for different databases to make the information readily available and searchable. And another thing that bioinformatics makes possible is that the thing is that human genes, such as those that are concerned with development, may be found in another organism, such as Drosophila. And so Drosophila becomes a useful model for investigating the way in which, in which such a gene has an, has an effect on development. And so microarrays can be used to find out when and where and which genes are being expressed during the development of a fruit fly. So then researchers can make use of those vast databases that are really easy to search. And then access information about these genes. So this gene is being expressed, all right. So let's compare it with the sequences available. Oh, so many, so many similarities. So this is basically the same gene, but slightly different. And then they figure out what protein products they code for. For example, they can search databases for identical or similar base sequences in other organisms and compare the primary structure of proteins and visualize the 3D structure of their protein products. So this is the first multicellular organism to have its genome fully sequenced, it has less than a thousand cells and 300 in nerve cells and because it is conveniently transparent, the development till fate of each of its cells can be mapped and because of its simplicity it is used as a model organism for studying the genetics of organ development. So when this is happening to an organ, which genes are being expressed and which gene products are doing their thing. And now all of the information we have about the genome of Plasmodium is available online. And this information is being used to find new methods to control the parasite. For example, being able to read gene sequences is providing valuable information in the development of vaccines for malaria. And this is it about bioinformatics topic.
of gene therapy and the challenges that we face in selecting appropriate vectors and in this we may also bring light to SCIG cystic fibrosis and inherited eye diseases. So we know genetic technology allows products that are specific to humans to be made. So previously while we had to extract insulin from the animals now we can make insulin that is specific to human beings and therefore likely to be more effective. And we've already looked at the advantages of producing human insulin by recombinant DNA. However, other proteins can also be produced by similar methods. For example, the human growth hormone, the thyroid stimulating hormone, and factor VIII, which is basically a blood clotting factor. And so all of this can also be made by recombinant DNA technology. And there are indeed advantages in using bacteria, which is a prokaryote, yeast, which is a fungus, and cultures of mammalian cells, which are eukaryotic, to produce these proteins. Fungus are also technically prokaryotic. And these cells have simple nutritional requirements, and that's what what's make their use so feasible and they produce huge volumes of product and the production facilities do not take up a lot of space and the process can be carried out almost anywhere in the world. There are few practical and ethical problems because proteins don't have to be extracted from animal sources or by collecting blood from many do donors. So the first learning outcome about advantages of using recombinant DNA to make human proteins. Number one, there aren't many ethical issues because the proteins do not do not have to be extracted from animal sources nor do they have to be nor do we have to collect blood from any donors because previously to collect factor eight a lot of people had to donate blood and from that the factor 8 had to be extracted but when we are using recombinant DNA we don't need to collect blood from many donors and we don't need to extract the protein from any animal source like previously when recombinant DNA technology had not prospered insulin used to be extracted from the pancreas of cattle but we don't have to do any of that so there aren't any ethical or not many ethical implications and there aren't a lot of practical concerns either because you have to culture these really small cells and they don't have very complicated nutritional requirements. You just have to provide them with the culture they want and they produce a lot of product and the production facilities don't need a lot of space and these processes can be carried out literally anywhere in the world. There aren't specific climatic requirements nor is the process extremely expensive or anything of the sort. So this is important and I would suggest we write this down so we don't forget. Number one, no ethical implications and this would be the heading and why aren't there any? Proteins do not have to be extracted from animal sources or by collecting blood from many donors. Or by collecting blood from any donors um, and also and uh, no 
practical problems either and when we have to detail on this we'll have to say they have simple nutritional requirements so they don't know any complicated they don't really need any complicated food source and large volume of products produced production facilities don't take up a lot of space because you literally just need a fermenter how much space do you think it will occupy don't need lots of space and can be carried out anywhere in the world almost anywhere in the world almost anywhere in the world and these are for the learning outcomes all right next so this was the advantages now let's talk about um a bit on disadvantages of using bacteria as opposed to a yeast or a culture of a mammalian cell well the disadvantage is that while the human proteins will be produced the bacteria will not modify their proteins in the same manner that eukaryotes would so it is much better therefore to use eukaryotic cells to produce human proteins and by eukaryotic it can either be a yeast culture or a mammalian, mammalian cell culture, culture and genetically modified hamster cells are used by several companies to produce factor 8 and this protein is essential for blood clotting and people who cannot make it are said to have hemophilia and the human gene for making factor 8 has been inserted into the hamster kidney and ovary cells which are then cultured in fermenters and the cells are constantly producing factor 8 which is extracted and purified before being used to treat the people who have hemophilia and these people need regular injections of factor 8 which before the availability of recombinant factor 8 came for came from donated blood and donated blood carried risks of infection for example from hiv recombinant factor 8 avoids such problems and this is something you can write in the advantages of using recombinant dna technology to produce protein products and there is also adenosine deaminase and we need high yields of this substance adenosine deaminase to treat severe combined immunodeficiency and they are made by a genetically modified insect larva called the cabbage looper moth caterpillar a mouthful isn't it yeah, please don't eat it <laughs> the enzyme is administered to patients while they are awaiting gene therapy or when gene therapy is not possible because SCID is something that can be treated by gene therapy and we will come on to that later but sometimes due to reasons it cannot be so
So now we come on to the concept of genetic screening and the advantages as well as the social and ethical implications and genetic screening is actually really closely associated with the IVF procedure, embryo biopsy, reselection as well as therapeutic abortions. You might be a bit surprised that I'm saying that these things are linked but they really are and stuff will make sense to you. How would you define genetic screening? It is analysis of a person's DNA to check for the presence of a particular allele. And this can be done in adults, in a fetus, or in an embryo. So when genetic screening is done on an adult, it often results in the adult um, opting for IVF. Yeah. And if it is and if someone is concerned and and when the IVF has been done, then embryo biopsy may be done. And all of this sometimes leads to preselection. And if genetic screening is also done on the fetus and sometimes it may result in therapeutic abortion. So these things are indeed linked. Because if, a, if an adult undergoes genetic screening and it turns out that he is a carrier for sickle cell anemia and he wants that his children do not inherit this allele, he can opt for IVF so that he outside of his outside of her womb there will be plenty of embryo right and then embryonic biopsy can be carried out when the embryo is at the eight cell stage a cell can be collected and the dna from the cell can be tested on to see which of the embryo does not have any sort of abnormal allele and that embryo can then be selected so basically because of this Genetic screening on both an adult and genetic screening of an embryo has been carried out. But if a person is pregnant, a lady is pregnant, and she chooses that her fetus be genetically screened, and if it turns out that it has some sort of a genetic ailment which is incurable and which might make difficult for a potential child, make life for a potential child very difficult, or which might lead to the child dying at a very young age. The parents and the woman that is pregnant might opt for a therapeutic abortion to save the child from a miserable life. So these things are really concerned. So if an adult woman has a family history of breast cancer, she may choose to be screened for the faulty alleles of the gene. BRCA1 and BRCA2. BRCA1 and BRCA2 are not themselves faulty alleles, they're basically genes. And sometimes people confuse the two. These are the genes, and what they're looking for are the faulty alleles. And if a person has these faulty alleles, their chance of getting or developing breast cancer is exponentially increased. And if the results are positive, the woman may elect to have her breasts removed before such a cancer may appear, elective mastectomy. And in 1989, the first designer baby was created, officially known as pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. The technique involved mis mixing the father's sperm with the mother's eggs in a, in a dish. Until now, this was a normal IVF procedure but afterwards there were differences because it was the next step that was new but this is a bit to do with pre-selection at the eight cell stage one of the cells from the tiny embryo was removed and this is embryo biopsy right and the DNA in the cell was analyzed and used to predict whether or not the embryo would have a genetic disease for which both the parents were a carrier. 
an embryo that was not carrying the allele that would cause the disease was chosen for implantation and embryos that did have the allele were subsequently discarded so this is sort of pre-selection but not really so this is called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis because the embryo has not yet been implanted so pre-implantation genetic diagnosis because there were a lot of potential embryos that were produced as a result of mixing the father's sperm and the mother's eggs in vitro that is outside of the womb and all of the embryos that resulted when they were at the eight cell stage embryo biopsy was carried out to identify an embryo that did not contain the faulty allele for which both the parents happen to be carriers. Um, and since then many babies have been born using this technique. Hence the hence the connection between genetic screening and IVF and this and the the link with pre-selection will make clear in a moment it has been used to avoid pregnancies in which the baby would have thalassemia hemophilia huntington's etc in 2004 it was first used in the uk to produce a baby that was a tissue match with an elder sibling with a view to using cells from the umbilical, umbilical cord as a transplant into the sick child. So this may be termed as pre-selection. For some time, genetic testing of embryos has been leaving prospective parents with a very difficult choice to make if the embryo is found to have a genetic condition such as Down syndrome or cystic fibrosis. The termination about whether or not to have a termination is very difficult to make. There is therapeutic abortion. And we are talking about a person, a woman who is already pregnant. And genetic testing, testing has proved that the child might have Down syndrome or cystic fibrosis because they have to make a decision. The woman has to make a decision whether or not to have a termination. The parents face a difficult decision basically. Now though advances in medical technology have provided us with even more ethical issues because the issue of pre-selection comes up. Some actually choose for the sex of the child and this is considered to be ethically wrong by a lot of people. So hopefully we have covered both IVF, embryo biopsy, pre-selection and therapeutic abortion and the social and ethical implications of genetic screening as well as the, the sort of diseases might, that might lead to a woman opting for termination. And now we're talking about the ethic portion in more detail. UK law allowed an embryo to be chosen that did not have an allele for a genetic disease and also one that did have a tissue type that would allow a successful transplant into a sick elder brother or a sister but it did not did not allow the addition of an allele to an egg sperm or zygote a line has to be drawn somewhere but feelings can run high many people believe that the law is allowing too much while others believe it is allowing too little Different countries have different attitudes and different regulations. There is controversy over other long established outcomes. For example, a fetus can now be screened for a genetic disease while in the uterus using two methods. And I would um, recommend you remember the names. Amniocentesis plus chronic chorionic Willis sampling.
The parents may then decide to have the pregnancy terminated if the embryo is found to have a genetic disease. However, there have been times when the decision has been made, even though the defect was a relatively minor one, with which the child could be expected to lead a fairly no normal life. Some have chosen to terminate pregnancy simply because the child is not the sex that they want. They have also used pre-implantation genetic diagnosis to select the sex of the embryo that they choose to implant. Many think that this sex preselection, as it is called, is unethical. And let's talk a little more about amniocentesis and chorionic villus sampling. Amniocentesis is used to obtain a sample of amniotic fluid at 15 to 16 weeks of pregnancy. So like about the fourth month and amniotic fluid is basically extracted. And then tests can be carried out on the sample to check the health of the fetus. Most amniotic samples have to however are to look for chromosomal mutations. So usually they are used for this purpose. An ultrasound scanning is used during amniocentesis and it is used to visualize the fetus and to locate the position of the placenta, the fetus and the umbilical cord and a suitable point for the insertion of the hypodermic needle is chosen and is marked on the abdominal skin surface and generally this position is away from the fetus, the umbilical cord and the placenta. That makes sense. Chorionic villus sampling however can be carried out a bit earlier at 10 to 13 weeks of pregnancy. So near the third month or third month or before and allows the parents to get an early warning of any genetic abnormality in the fetus then it's possible with amniocentesis and a small part of the placenta called the chorion is removed by a needle which is very narrow less than 0.8 millimeter in diameter and the procedure is monitored via ultrasound scanning so ultrasound scanning is involved both in amniocentesis and also in chorionic villus sampling so whereas in amniocentesis we were actually using ultrasound to mark the position of insertion as far away from the um, fetus, the umbilical cord and the placenta. For chorionic villus sampling we actually have to look towards the placenta because it's part of the placenta called the chorion which needs to be removed with the help of a very narrow syringe about 0.8 millimeters in diameter and ultrasound scanning plays a part in both of this and it carries a small risk of miscarriage which is increased by about 1 to 2 percent and a slightly greater risk for amniocentesis but before 15 weeks chorionic villus sampling is probably less risky than amniocentesis whereas if you want to carry the test out before 16 you should go for chorionic villus sampling but afterwards amniocentesis is a better option but if you try amniocentesis before the 16 month mark it will probably be increase the risk of miscarriage by a larger amount so you can write this down Amniocentesis 